comprehensive plan is to infill the sidewalks and where we have gaps in some of these subdivisions. Yep. We're just trying to get it not gapped out of a safety thing. Right. That's the biggest thing is the safety. Right. As far as erasing the line, putting in a bigger structure with, I would talk with P and Z about that and see if they can work me down that because it uh, your lot is it all is it still two lots or just one? It's still I still pay taxes as as taxes I pay one but it's still separated at two. Okay. So I mean I own two lots but they said for me to combine it to make it into one lot, and this was, uh, I guess I lived back here eight years, I'll be nine years this November, but they said when I bought that, I bought it like a year after I was there, they said I had to pay, file for a mini subdivision fee, at that time it was 150 bucks, I have no idea what it is now, and at that time it was to have the surveyor come in and erase that line and file all the forms, and that was going to cost me around eight, nine hundred bucks, so do with the sidewalk in there, do I still got to do that? And at the same time, can I put a driveway approach in there? Do I got to file, um, apply for permits for do the sidewalk? Do I got to have a building permit to put the sidewalk into? I'm not aware of that. I'll, I'll, I'll not for a that. sidewalk per se, no. Linda. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think if you did want to put an approach in there, we would probably look at a like a street approach permit sort of a thing. Yeah. But in terms of uh, you know, and, and uh, I know we are in the middle of a, re a revision of our city code, but. Right now, if you wanted to put a larger garage, um, because it's one parcel, I don't know why you, you wouldn't necessarily be able to do that. I don't think that would be a, a, an issue, at least based on my understanding. Right. But you're saying it's not one parcel, you it's, it's, it's two, two parcels. parcels. Well, I mean, based on what the county has recorded right. on their GIS, it shows up as one parcel. Right. So we would apply that. So we wouldn't necessarily, you know, we wouldn't necessarily require you to, to have setbacks from the internal lines, Right. as far as I know. Well, that's, I mean, that's what I'm saying. The county considers as one parcel, but if I want to sell it off, and say say I would do the mini subdivision and have the surveyor come in and raise that line, then to resell that later, if I put a garage towards the back and I can sell that, say, in five, ten years when I'm closer to retirement, hopefully, uh, <laughs> if I want to separate that sell, sell as one, then i got to go back and reverse the process. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's my big question is because I, I think yeah, it, would all, be, it, it wouldn't be allowable. Part of the intent of the code is so that we don't have garages in the middle of a subdivision. Right. So if, you know what I mean? You right. wouldn't be able to re split them then in the future. Well, he's already got it together. Yeah. I don't think If you build a garage on the Just one on parcel, that one. we wouldn't allow you to subdivide it again it's to sell off part of it. Right. Okay. Or at least historically, because we don't want a garage with no house right. in the middle of a residential subdivision. Right. So I mean, I already, I already, I already got one garage in my backyard. I wish I would have put that over in the empty lot. But I wish I would have bought the lot first. Brandon, did you have something? No, I was just gonna say it looks like it is all one parcel on the county GIS. Okay. Yeah, was, I got the letter from the county and said that I had to combine the millers. I was yeah. gonna get taxed higher because it was a, a buildable lot if I wouldn't have done that at that time. Right. So I guess the intent of what the ordinance was was why these letters just went out to everybody was to fill in these sidewalks in places where there's just this gap. Okay. Now, if it's a newer subdivision where the lots are actively being sold, you know, hey, the yeah. for sale signs there, and it could, somebody could walk in right. tomorrow and buy it and build in it, then that waits till the house can be built. Right. But if there's these other lots we have throughout town, and it's basically it's a it's a safety yeah. thing. I know I'm guilty. I, I got, got I got I got the only one lot in that in that in that block that don't have the sidewalk. Yeah, it wasn't picking on you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that because it's, it's a safety thing. Right. And we're just trying to get that stuff because. The number of kids that are out now and people using the use sidewalk out in the road into the sidewalk. Okay. All the other things are building all that. Check with Tim as far as what can be done. Yeah, I mean, okay. certainly if you're looking to, to add a garage or something like that, we'd be we'd glad to work with you on that. All right. Okay. All right. Yep. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Mayor's report. I've got a couple things tonight. Um, just some different things of feedback I've got over the last few weeks and conversations. Uh, but just wanted to first congratulate Linda, who was elected president of the Municipal Clerks and Finance Officers Association of Minnesota for 2020 and 21. So thanks for representing the city of Kasson and the state uh, organization. Appreciate that. Um, I like also the if you if you if you happen to visit the liquor store for any reason, whether you're just there to say hi or you're a, a customer, appreciate it if you tell the, the employees that are working there a special thank you. Um, of all of our employees who worked over the last three months, 
they were kind of on the front lines in the retail sector where people didn't take too kindly to having to wear a mask or to have the glass there or no cash. And there, there were several incidents where customers weren't the nicest to them um, and they stuck with it and did it. So if you see them, just tell them thank you. And it's appreciated that some of the young people there took some abuse because they didn't take cash and it wasn't really their, their decision, but they took the brunt. So I thank them for all they did during that. And the liquor store sales have been um, fantastic. So that's going to help out <laughs> some of our taxes for next year. Uh, you know, what people do in a pandemic is they obviously stock their liquor cupboard at home daily. So, um, and then just to have it on the public record, you know, I had some questions. We had a few people out uh, with their signs uh, Friday night protesting along Matterville Avenue. You know, I had people call me, ask me, well, what's the city? Ordinance on it. Well, the, the city ordinance is the First Amendment applies to everybody in the country, right? You have your right to protest for whatever reason or whatever you want to say, basically wherever you want on public property. So not on private property, but on public property, as long as you don't block somebody's way, you say or do whatever you want. So um, just to spread it out there and that uh, we aren't going to stop it or we're not going to you know, advertise it, but it's, it's the First Amendment right that everybody has to express their opinion. So and we appreciate that. And then just a shout out to our, uh, our, our local police department. Uh, with all the grief that the industry, but your, your profession has been getting over the past two weeks and beyond that for a long time now, just wanted to let you know that I, I don't know if I can speak for everybody in the council, but I think I can, that you have our 100% support. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that we have a community-based policing department already because you're part of the community. Your kids go to school with the community's kids. You're part of the community. Um, and just to pass on to all the officers that we appreciate the job they've done. Um, not to say that all of us and everything we do every day aren't striving to be better every day at what we do, but we support you and we have you back 100%. So just to be pass it on to their officers, we appreciate that. So thank you. That's all I've got tonight. Any public forum? Anybody got cards for public comment? On to old business pool opening procedures. <laughs> so everyone should have received. Uh, uh, basically the COVID-19 protocols plan as well as a uh, map. Um, I know that uh, Josh, our manager, and, and uh, Ronnie have been working hard on this. You know, I've, worked, you know, I've been working with them too to try and make sure that uh, we're ready if the council does decide to open. Um, as, as the council members are probably aware, uh, last week the governor authorized uh, uh, aquatic centers pools to be open in the state of Minnesota um, and to 50% capacity. Um, so uh, at that point, you know, I let the council know that we were going to be looking at it. The guidance we had gotten earlier this year from both the uh, park board and the council was that if we could get the pool open before the July 4th weekend or the 1st of July, we wanted to take a, take a, a real serious look at it. Um, so based on that, we do feel like we have a, a reasonably good uh, plan with it. Um, we've provided information to you for finances, so you can kind of see how the performance was last year. Um, aquatic centers in the state of Minnesota, there's only two of them that don't run at a loss to service we provide to the community. Um, so, you know, certainly we take into account the, the, the possibility that we um, may see some loss there as, as usual. But we do think that if the pool is to open, um, we would see strong utilization by the community. We've had a lot of feedback from community members, and I'm sure council members have as well, that they would like to potentially see it open. But we wanted to leave it up to you. We feel like we have a plan in place. Out of 63 original uh, staff people that were, were offered jobs that were hired, we were able to, to contact 55 of them. We're still interested in continuing to work at the facility. So we do feel that staffing is, it would be appropriate, you know, we have at appropriate levels. Um, a number of other facilities in the area have chosen to open up. Uh, Stewartville is opening. That's one of the more similar facilities. Um, Oitana is also be opening. They're gonna be opening potentially a little bit later. They're having some staffing issues. And the number of the smaller communities are looking at opening as well in our area. Um, so. I guess that's the question tonight is what does the city council want to do with that? How would you like us to proceed? Um, you know, and I'd be glad to take any questions that you may have. I guess, like I said last meeting, if we can open it under the guidelines that are there, my opinion is we should open it. But I really want to make sure that if there's, are we considering prioritizing cast and residents over non-residents and somehow to, to communicate because I've had several. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. So when I spoke with, uh, with Ronnie and with Josh today, I had a couple of questions that were very similar there. I said they wanted to know how it would be feasible to make sure that the cash and residents that are paying property taxes or their subordinates facility 
can utilize the facility. And so um, based off of the feedback I've gotten from them, we're looking at a reservation style system um, with a certain number of slots left open for, for cast and residents only. So that would allow us, we're looking at, the, in essence, two sessions. Sort of an early afternoon session and a later you know, afternoon, early evening session, which those folks will be making those reservations ahead of time, which would give us an idea of how many total we're looking at. I think our max uh, capacity is going to be something between 260 and 280, something along those lines. Um, so I can guarantee that we will have slots available for cast and residents. And based off what Josh and Ronnie told me, that's something we, we can definitely say. Um, additionally, for larger groups, for example, I know there's some child care groups that attend or community ed sort of things, we're making an early morning slot available. Um, so from, from 8 until 11.30 will be available for those groups to come in and utilize the facility. And that will just be local um, you know, groups, at least initially. You know, we don't know exactly how this everything's going to go. You know, we expect right away we're going to see a, a pretty, pop, you know, it's going to be popular. You know, after two or three weeks, we may look at saying, okay, how are, what are we doing that's working? What are we doing that needs to be changed? So, um, you know, so that was one of the questions I asked too, and, and they said, yes, you know, we can do that via the, the reservation system. We will know, you know, the specific number of where folks are coming from, when they're going to be there, which session they're signing up for, and we can actually, we can utilize that software to help us with that. No, I just I did want to reiterate that I have received um, several emails from cast and residents asking that direction. That, uh, sure. <coughs> yeah, and I mean that's important to me too because I think it's it's really valuable for our, our like I said they're the folks that are paying taxes here they deserve the first crack at it. However, I do want to fill the pool up as much as we <coughs> can safely. You know, I mean if, sure. if we're going to operate it, we want to operate at that maximum number which means we, you know, based off of what I'm seeing, probably Rochester is going to be one of the areas we'll draw from the most, you know, which, do anyway. which we do anyways, right. But, but, you know, acknowledging that we have a certain number of slots that are only going to be for cash and residents, knowing that people should be able to always get in, you know, after that, then we're going to say, okay, we want to try and cash flow this as much as we can, bring that revenue into our community, because we have a great facility. You know, if we're going to be staffing it, fully staffing it, then we want to make sure that it's flowing. Um, you've got the map in there. You can take a look at that. It does show some of the safety, safety measures we'll be taking there. Um, social distancing is going to be a really big part of this, and that is a hard part when it's kids uh, because, you know, our lifeguards are not necessarily adults. You know, they're teens, and they're going to say, you know, here's what you need to do. You need to follow the lines. You need to follow the, the spacing and things like that, and we're going to try and enforce that to the best of our ability. Um, between the sessions, we're going to be doing a full deep clean. You know, they're taking a, a significant period of time. They're going to be fogging. You were talking about fogging before. We're going to be wiping down all the surfaces, exterior surfaces. Now, if we're having days at 95, I'm, I think we're going to be okay. But it's going to be every day. And that's a big part of our training over the next week is going to be with the staff. Know that they know how to react to all these issues. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that they do have a good plan in place. And like I said, if there are any <coughs> questions about that, you can see uh, facilities, social distancing, staffing. Um, and then the, the disinfecting part of it will be really big, too. So um, right now, that's our plan. If the council wants to move forward, if the council says, you know what, we're going to take a pass, we're all so comfortable with that. You know, we, we, uh, but we want to serve the community. And I see this as a really good way for us to serve the community, a really public way of showing that we want people. Because people are going to be stuck here. You know, there are a lot of folks who are going to skip their vacations this year. They're going to be close to home. They need to have something to do. So I question I, oh, sorry. Well, I just, I had one other question about the reservation system. Sure. Um, bearing in mind that people could be coming from long distances and this is something that has been brought up in the past, mm -hmm. even before COVID. Would there be a way, say for instance, we have the large group booked in in the morning and we have what happens at least once every two weeks, which is somebody who the pool. <laughs> is there a way that the people who have the reservations can be contacted to be told, sorry, we had an issue, you can't come during this time period? Yeah, absolutely. We should have all of their contact information. Okay. I mean, we're going to be sending email and most likely a telephone number. Okay. I mean, we're asking people to give us their phone number and their email. I mean, they could choose not to fill that in. Sure. But if we're able to contact them, then definitely that's something we want to do. Okay. Because I don't want somebody driving from Mankato or some group yeah. that says, hey, we're going to do a party and they can't make it or some softball team or something, yeah. you know, because right, we have an issue where we have to close it down for an afternoon or an evening or something. So. That has been a recurring complaint in the past is that people, there was no notification sure. the pool was closed for. Well, I've spoken with Ronnie and, and Josh too because I think communication is going to be vital to this. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, rain rain days too. I mean, 
you know, a day like this morning, I mean, right now maybe we could have it open, but it's pretty cool for it even today. We're going to have to be putting that out on a regular basis and communicating it really well. So I think that's, that's going to be important no matter what, like you said, whether it's COVID or not, we can improve that. Dan, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, I was reading through and it says that you're charged at $5 per person. Didn't we, as part board and council, change it to $6 this year? Well, I know that there was consideration of that. I think that Ronnie had felt um, with the, and that's something that can be adjusted still. I, I think that Ronnie want to make sure that everybody's on the with same the situation page. here. You know, we had looked at adjusting the price back down for this summer. But once again, that's something you know. I don't know that's set in stone, and I, I, I didn't follow all of that conversation you guys had when you were setting the prices. So, well, I'm fine with that. I was just, I was reading it. I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't two prices and people were confused. Sure. I would leave it at five since we're not doing the pass. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and I'm fine with that too. I just. <laughs> make sure it was the same. It's a special year, you know. We, you know, I think that's where Ronnie was kind of going. Yep. Like, you know, like you said, we don't want to confuse people. So, yeah. I mean, plus it's easier. Well, I was just going to say, you're not handing cash back. You're not having to yep. go through all the cash. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so we will be requiring. Just another note. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be requiring the uh, inside staff to wear face masks at all time. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who's doing any kind of food service, uh, right now that's the guidance we have. We also won't necessarily be offering all the items we have in the past. Uh, for example, I don't think they're going to be doing, you know, uh, hot dogs and broths and things like that, just because of the, at least not right away. I pushed for broths. I did. I was like, they got to do broths because I mean that's why I'm going to go for lunch. But, uh, <laughs> but I think right now it's going to be mostly the, the self item, you know, packaged items, ice cream, uh, things like chips and things like pop, things that don't require as much handling, because you know that's the last thing in the world we want somebody to get sick from something that happens. Are we also actually planning to do like six foot spacing dots leading up to the concessions? Because that's usually yeah, we we're going to be spacing on the slides. That's a good example. You know, on the slides we're going to be um, they have actually are putting ties on. I think it's every third step, which will give us six feet separation. And the same thing is true with uh, the concessions. We'll be spreading them out. You know, I've talked. I, I mentioned to them. Well, maybe it'd be possible even to have kind of like if you ever go to Rochester, the Culvers over there, where they've got somebody outside who kind of takes the orders and walks it down and brings them in. It's like, you know, for example, if a family says during break they want to go outside and sit outside for a little while if they don't want to get together, you know, if you've got a couple of kids with you or something, maybe we could take that order and then bring it to the, have one person take that and bring it in and then take it back out to them or something like that, just to make it easier. Because otherwise, I mean, this isn't going to be perfect. I, I mean, I'm well cognizant we're going to get complaints because, well, you know, it's a 10-minute break and I lost a half an hour to a snack because I was standing in line for that long because it took that long. You know, I... I'm it's afraid it's we, that way ever right, we just can't make it perfect this right. year and we're going to do the best we can. And, and we're going to know, like I said, after two weeks we can reevaluate and say, okay, this is working, this is not. You know, for example, the showers. Right now we're, we're going to require people to wear their suits. We're going to ask people to wear their suits to the pool so there isn't changing there because we're basically going to have a lot of those clothes. You know, and, so, and then we're going to have somebody standing there when they come in who's going to say, yep, you know, we've always said you have to shower before you go in. Well. This year, there's going to be somebody saying they're saying, "Yep, you got to, you really have to shower before you go in." Because once again, we don't have any of those issues. But so. we still have the outdoor showers. Too. That's what I mean. Using the outdoor showers, okay. people are going to be funneled in. That's another part of it too. It's it's kind of like Ivy or one of the supermarkets where we're going to have line. You know, there's going to be guidance and arrows and things like that. Where this is the way you go in, this is the way you go out. You know, because we want to provide safety too. You know. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for you on that? Okay, entertain a motion to approve. I'll make that motion. Thanks, Dan. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Thanks, Dwayne. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thanks for working on that. What day do you think? 19th is Thanks. the earliest. Well, because I'm already getting questions. <laughs> sure. 19th is the date I've been told. And, it, you know, I prefer if we can start on a weekday like that because I mean, I know Saturday is going to be packed. So it's good if we can kind of get everybody going on Friday and. Well, it probably will be too, but we might not have as many folks from Rochester right away then. Yeah. You know, to maybe be able to, because I want to see how this is going to look myself at once it's full up and around. And, and maybe, you know, if the council wants to get in on a Thursday night and go for a lap swim or something, you know, I can help you out. <laughs> maybe I'll sink right to the bottom. Yeah. Maybe yeah. a little cold yeah. still. Okay, we're getting off topic. Yes, sir. Open the pool as soon as possible. Yes, sir. Thank you. Gotcha. Um, H1, electric department concerns. That's the email you sent. Yeah, so there are a couple things in there, and I'll skip over one of them for now. Um, can maybe handle that during my report. The, uh, the other two, and they're not necessarily concerns, one of them is a concern though, and I'll pass this around here. This is just a rough draft of some revised language. 
we're having some issues where folks are, well, they're putting landscaping and they're putting walls and other things in front of the, the electrical boxes. And, um, and you know, in some cases we, you know, or we always try to work with the residents on that. But I mean, it is a city right away. You, I mean, you're really not supposed to put anything in there. But there's a couple of examples where there, there are definitely uh, ones that are going to affect the level of service in an emergency. And I know that Jared, our supervisor, is very concerned about that. And so he just wants to make sure that, um, you know, if we have to go in there and tear something out in the middle of the night to get the power back on, you know, that's kind of what you've got there is language where, you know, we're basically saying that that's what it is. If we need to get the power on, you know, sorry you had your, your decorative fence in the way, you know, probably shouldn't have had it there to begin with. Um, you know, like I said, you know, Jared's working hard with people to try and make sure that it doesn't become a bigger issue. But he just wanted to bring that to the council, make you aware that he's seen a real upswing in that. And it's great folks are taking care of their property. They want to make improvements, they want to beautify it. I think that's fantastic. I mean, I need some help. So they, they certainly could, you know, come around. Like around, around the pedestals. Pretty much around pedestals, around boxers, around, um, those are um, just, th that's a real issue that he's seeing a real upswing. And I've seen a couple pretty bad ones before where it's like a solid fence. You're, you're never going to get away from it. I, I deal with phone pads, fiber pads all over the country. <coughs> we'll be talking about this today. Two years from now, they'll be growing plants and putting decorative rocks and whatever else up against them because they want to hide that transformer. Mm -hmm. yeah. They want to hide that foam pad. It, they don't it's to never going to go away. Sure. It won't. Well, I know it's not going to go away. He's suggesting some language that would just say, hey, here's what it is so that when folks do it, you know, we warn them and say, hey, you're in the right of way. And then when they go and tear out, nobody is going to be surprised by this. And neither, I mean, my goal is to inform you as a council mm -hmm. so that you know when somebody comes to council and says, hey, I'm upset about this, I mean, this is the rule and this is why we did what we did. Yeah. That makes sense. Copy on the, the only suggestion I would on. have to the leaders this year is explain to them precisely why, which is if your lights go out and we need to act, we will need to access that box, therefore. Sure. And that might click a little bit better than, hey, you're just obstructing something that you said not do. Yeah. Well, I'll certainly suggest that to Jerry and have him revise that to include some. I mean, I don't have a problem putting it right in there and saying, sure. yep, this is what we're going to do. Be blunt about it. You know, because that's what's going to happen. Sure. Especially yeah. if it's winter time or, or it's, a, it's a crisis issue with flooding or something like that. So you don't have no action required on that tonight, Mr. Mayor, but I wanted to bring that to you. The other item was um, that I, I did a drive around over in the Prairie Willows area, kind of on the west side of town there where they're just finishing up there. They look like they're going to be bathing soon. And um, Jared is asking that we be, uh, he'd like to reinforce our electrical grid over in that area. However, it would require some overhead line. He knows in the past the council has uh, has maybe not felt as, as uh, disposed towards those overhead lines. <coughs> and basically, what it would mean would be running lines along 34 um, into that sub subdivision, kind of where KM Telecom has their they have their uh, building right. there on the on the, the, the right. west corner, southwest corner. So that would mean that those overheads would be along that that uh, Highway 34, you know, basically going from where they they terminus. I mean, it's I think maybe three blocks. Um, so that would allow us to loop the electrical because what happens right now is on the northwest side of town if we have a fault, for example, on the, the far northwest, the fault actually goes all the way down to where that comes down there on 34. So for them to backtrace that means that they have to go, I mean, they have to leave the lights on or leave them off a lot longer because they have to actually drive through and go and check those faults. And the reason that he's talking about overhead is he indicated that especially in the wintertime, accessing those underground, you know, if we bore it in, <coughs> Um, it's just going to take way longer. The other point he made was in terms of cost. He's looking at about a, a third the cost to do overhead as opposed to to, uh, to doing the boring. And I, I will note that this is just going to be an overhead along 34. It's not going to be in, in the actual residential neighborhood itself. So I want to bring that to you. You know, he had some questions about it and wanted to know how the council felt about potentially reinforcing the electric grid there. So is the intent for that to be temporary overhead or? I permanent. think his intention is permanent. Then we're going back to the Halloween ice storm. Mm -hmm. That's when everything started going underground after the ice storm because we had power lines going down all over the place. I don't think it's right to go back to that. I know it's more expensive to put it underground, but it's cheaper and lower. It ends up being more expensive to have it above ground. Sure. It really does. Well, I mean, I, I don't really, I mean, for me, there's the cost. I always try to watch the city's expenditures. 
but at the same time, I mean, if that's the council, what the council wants to do, I mean, he wants to reinforce it there so he can move it. And whether we put it in the ground or above ground is, I mean, there's a couple things. If we'd like to do this project, secondly, if, uh, if you don't want to do the overhead, you know, we'll bore it. You need to have the knowledge that it's going to cost, you know, probably three times. And if that's okay, hey, get, then get we'll the cost on it. Okay, we get some specific cost for it. Once again, not something that's required today. Right. I just want to bring this to you because he, he had some concerns about it. And the big thing about the overhead is when those, that damage does happen, it's all self-insured. So we don't have any, any overhead line you see in the city. If something falls over, we have to pay cash for it. There's no insurance for it. Right. There's no <coughs> underground, though, there is some insurance. Okay. Well, I mean, I don't have a problem with myself, as yeah. I said. I'm just bringing this to you because I want to make sure that you are aware that yeah. we're taking a look at it. Since we've gone through blizzards, ice storms, floods, <laughs> pandemics, and now a storm last night. We had a hurricane last night, so who the heck knows like, when the wind's going to come. Yeah. So yeah. We're just going to 350,000 people in Michigan out of power from down lives. Are they really? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> the wind was terrible. Okay. Well, right. Thank That's you. That's all I needed on that. Thank you. Administrator's report. number of items in there um, and I obviously I'll always take questions right away did want to highlight a couple of things dr uh, directly there um, and one of them is underneath as well this natural gas franchise fee question which I think I maybe broached a little bit earlier this year in your packet I've attached the actual enabling document from the city code and it's something that when it was created I'm not sure if they were enforcing it at that time however we haven't actually been collecting it that I can tell for some time um, and I think it would be something we want to consider in terms of trying to generate as much revenue this uh, this year. Um, I think there are a couple different ways that we could do that. We, do, we could do it on an account basis or we could do it on a percentage of sales basis. And what I'd like to see, if we're going to do this, it would be nice to segment that revenue out. For example, if we were looking at a project in the future, if we do, do a, a public safety facility, we could start collecting that revenue now and put it aside and it would actually support, would help support that instead of having necessary levy for an entire project. So either we could pay it down with cash on hand, so instead of you know spending $2 million, we could spend 1.5, or we could use that to help subsidize bond payments in the future. And that's where I see the positive to having those franchise fees. We do collect franchise fees from our cable companies already, so it's not something that's exceptional, and many communities do collect the franchise fees from natural gas as well. So, I mean, it already exists. It's just a matter of we aren't, we haven't actually told them to start collecting for us. So I just want to consider, I don't need any action tonight once again okay. on it, but I mean, I, I would strongly suggest that we take a look at this. And as, as I said, if we're segmenting the revenue out, we're not putting the general fund, and we're taking, we're saying, okay, this is gonna be revenue set aside for a special project that will allow us in the future not to have to raise the tax levy as much. And to me, it just, uh, it makes a lot of sense because you know we, we do have this company that's generating revenue off of our residents. But you know where they're going to get that I franchise. Do. For I do. I do. Okay. I'm aware of it. But but I mean, it's one of those things where I mean, I don't know that many you know people would question that, you know, they're using our right of ways to lay their no. lines. Right now, we're not collecting anything from them. Right. No, I so, I understand. Sure. No, I know where the revenue's going to come from. It's yeah. going to show up on that bill. Yep. So. Okay. I'm out of the. A couple other things. Uh, let's see here. We do have that uh, mayor and council salary um, discussion. I know that uh, a couple of the council members had asked about that, and Linda, you had brought that to my attention, so we did include that. So if there are any changes that we wanted to take a look at, now we're, be, we're starting the budget process, so it's time to take a look at that. And the, of course, the way that works is it's a year out kind of a thing, so we wouldn't see any changes right away. But uh, I know, especially, I think it was with per diems, was that the biggest issue, Linda? Yeah, because, um, the extra meeting fee is $35. Well, if it's one meeting that lasts all day long and one meeting that lasts an hour is the disparate discrepancy that we want to uh, fix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, people should know what we get for doing this. Sure. And it's, it's not yeah. much. Right now, the their salary is set at $4,000 a year and uh, the other council members are 3000 so yeah, that right. can be part of the record too. But I mean, me and Dwayne spent the whole day at the sure. Dodge County Annex. Sure. No lunch, no nothing. Oh, and wow. for $35? No lunch? No. <laughs> Ask well, Dwayne. Uh, we did the same thing with uh, the bargaining unit. Sure. Negotiation. So, um, 
I am I'm all for increase the per diem, but I, w I would recommend that we cap it to maybe. I mean, I guess what, what I would suggest is that you utilize the same policy mm -hmm. that you would for employees. I mean, employees, when they go to conference and things like that, they have a, a meal allowance, and it's capped for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I would say that there's no reason when the council members are on official business that you couldn't certainly follow the same policy. I mean, especially for meals, because if you're on city business, then there's no reason the city shouldn't say, yeah, we're going to give you the 15 bucks that you went to McDonald's and got a lunch for it. I don't know. I mean, you guys can certainly talk about it, but that's not unusual. And, in many cities, it's pretty typical, actually, as long as you're in city business. Would it make sense to do two? Uh, would, it, would it make sense to do two different rates so that it stays at like thirty-five dollars for meetings up to a certain amount of time, and then if mm -hmm. it exceeds that, then there is an additional. Exactly. I'm, I'm for that. I understand what you guys are saying. I'm in a unique position. I don't. I don't have. I don't get paid vacation. I run my own business, so I just have to go to work that night. And my stuff done. So, but some people, when you're there for all day, you're basically burning vacation or not getting paid from your job. I mean, we do this for really special, crazy reasons going here. Yeah. But uh, yeah. so you love your community so much. Absolutely. But I can see where the, the negotiations. Cause this negotiation, we spent one full day. The last one, I spent three or four full days that we did whatever stuff. And I get that. So. But just to be clear to so the public knows, we're not following Rochester where we want to give everybody no, you know, no, huge no. range. It's like it's four yeah. grand for this seat for the year and three thousand for each of your seats for the year. We're just talking about that. The unusual meetings that are over four hours or three hours or whatever. Right. So. If you're okay with it, I can check with Byron Stewart Bill, some of the other towns around here, see what they do and bring you some uh, examples yeah. and yeah. some uh, something that yeah. see if you want to pass it, okay? That'd be good idea. <laughs> Thanks for that. That's not good, everybody. Yep. yep. That's very All right. Okay. Thank you. Just a couple other things to note. Uh, we do have uh, uh, Congressman Hagdorn's visit tomorrow. I'll be here. Um, so he'll be here for that. Mm -hmm. And I know we also were contacted by the the Feehan, uh, group, and you forwarded me that email, and I respond to them as well. Yeah. So we have had some interest from some of our local representatives or potential representatives. So we'll certainly try to work with them in an appropriate way to uh, make sure that they have access that they'd like to talk to council members and things like that. Um, special session. Looks like the governor is going to be calling a special session. There's a couple things in particular that he needs to deal with, well, that the legislature needs to deal with. One of those is the CARES Act funding. So the state of Minnesota received a substantial amount of money. During the legislative session, there were a couple different bills that were not, you know, fullness of time approved. That would be nice for us because that allows us to have some of that. I mean, the money was intended to go to cities and counties. And the only two counties in the state that have gotten have been Hennepin and Ramsey. So I know talking with Nancy, I think there are definitely costs that we would be able to apply towards that. Um, some of our staffing costs and, and different things we've done for protecting safety and promoting that in our community. So hopefully they'll deal with that. That'll be helpful to us. Um, there's one other thing. I know earlier this year we had talked about the um, transfer from the electric when we were setting those electric rates. I know I discussed that with, with you and with Dwayne last week. Um, Nancy and I just wanted to make sure we were clear that during the budget process this fall, the revenue that's generated in excess of what we normally would have been generating will go towards reducing the tax levy. I think that was the gist of what I got from the council, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to make sure that we were good on that. So is that correct understanding? We're that's looking at about $180,000, I think, that was there. That's yeah. my understanding. Yep. Okay. Is that what we need to work with? The in, the, in the budget, as a transfer out of 2021. That's right. This year? 20, the 2021 budget. All right. I believe that's what. Yeah, I mean, that was my understanding of it, but I just, I, want I just wanted to make sure. Which year? Structurally. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Follow the money trail. Other than that, I think that is everything I've got. Okay. Thank you very much. Engineer's report has nothing on it tonight. So we'd like right. to thank Brandon for coming, and we did get word that 16th Street Northeast is now open. The mm -hmm. paving and striping is done, so thanks for getting that done and staying on top of it. Yep. You're welcome. Okay. Anything else you want to just. And probably so update that. Okay. Dwayne, did you want to know what the schedule was for uh, an update on the schedule for your project over in your neighborhood there? No? No. I I mean, it's it's yeah. going to get there eventually. It's just not a way. It needs to be sooner than later because we've got to get some stuff set in the state. So we're trying to chase the contractor down and get in there and do work. And I see that they're televising that uh, outlet station uh, just north of me. Yeah, the works is doing some work for that station.
there are about 20 guys in yellow shirts around that. There's uh, some tree trimming too today, too, the tree service out there along the bike path. There is, there is one thing when they are out televising the sanitaries and stuff, they're not setting up cones. Okay. Like people are coming around the corner and then if they're right in the middle of the road, they're not. So I don't know if you want to. But they are using flashing lights and everything. If they weren't the other day, I'd come around the corner. There was one like that I saw they were. Okay. They, they love the like box stand. I wouldn't run into it. No, but. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, some of them, I mean, like the ones that are in the intersection in the middle of uh, Fifth Street and 8th Ave Northwest, that one was easy to see. But some of the ones where they're not quite in the intersection, if you're looking the wrong way before you turn. Just, you know. Make it a little easier for them guys. And uh, I know we got a couple calls, Linda, about some issues too. The brake procedure for us when we get, for example, if somebody's back up, backed up or something like that, Linda. We had a couple of toilets back up, blow up. Uh, we had two calls yesterday, yeah. and we referred them to Hydro Clean. Okay. Is that the right procedure we should be following? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they well, called me, and I had them call you. Yeah. So. We sent them on to the contractor. Okay. They were just the one of the bubbling, the toilets were in the basement were bubbling, and they just happened to be right out in front of their house running the camera. So I, I said, I have no idea. That's why I told them to call and get a hold of somebody. Sure. So okay. We should talk about posting something on the city website too, so people know to fill in all of their uh, vents and floor traps, or uh, floor drains and traps and the floor drains too. Huh? So. Okay. Thank you. I'll send you some okay. Thank you. Personnel number one, um, accept resignation of Lance Deep Dieter. Uh, he'll be resigning from the electric department and moving on elsewhere. So I'd like to thank Lance for his service to the city of Casson and wish him the best in his next adventure. And I'll entertain a motion to accept his resignation. So moved we'll with thanks. thanks. Yep. Thanks, Dwayne. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Thanks, Dan. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, number two, we added Josh Hansen leave of absence. Everybody, you got an email on that a little bit earlier. I have paper copies too, which I can pass around here today. <coughs> so, um, speaking with, uh, with, uh, with our incoming police chief, he had some questions about this, and, and I've seen it in other cities where um, someone who's promoted into a position within the same department um, would submit a request to allow for this. Basically, I think, and then Josh can, of course, answer for himself too, but it would allow for, uh, if for, for example, if the situation doesn't work out agreeably for both parties, they would be able to return to their, their job. Um, and it certainly is up to the council if they wanted to consider that, how they wanted to consider that request. Because we've got this, this is different because right, we're not a union anymore, mm -hmm. but in the union contract, I believe we have this language. We did the same thing with uh, the electric department last year, was so many days, do an evaluation. Council says, eh, and you say, well, I'm not interested anymore. You got protection to go back to your job. Yeah. I personally don't have any problem offering that or the same. Well, same one thing I, one I, thought, I thought about, and Josh, I can get your, your your essay on this too, is, you know, when it says an indefinite leave, the thought I had was perhaps granting up until that probationary period is done, that leave, you know, where you say, okay, if any time in the first six months we say, you know, it doesn't. It's not working for us. Or he says, you know, if this is not what I was interested in doing, he would go, maybe able to return to that job. But I would say after that point, you know, we'll be looking at potentially filling, which means I don't want to necessarily have to terminate another officer to reopen that position. Right. Um, I mean, that's just the thought process I have because I want to protect. I want to protect the employee that we have. I want him to feel comfortable and say, you know what, if this is just not working for me, I'm going to go back to my my old job because I was doing really well with that. At the same time, I don't know that indefinite is the word I would use. So I mean, that's up to the council. Though. Yeah, I don't know if I I, I was reading that. Um, indefinite sets a precedent too with our with the contract we currently have. I think it's like 90 days in the contract, or 180 days. I would say the probationary period. I, I mean, with that. does that make sense, Josh? It it's just I'm just comparing it to some larger agencies. I don't want to use Minneapolis as an example, but uh, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Some of those larger agencies, like once you get uh, above lieutenant, you see those are appointed positions, so you leave the union, sure. and then are, basically you serve it for the mayor, and the mayor can say, all right, no, it's not working out, and you go back to your position as lieutenant. So that's what I was basically going to find. And I see that too, but I, I would say the probationary period here, and just with, with our department, with the size, and that, I think you're going to do a fantastic job. So. Yeah, the only argument I would since this is a department head position, 
if the probationary period is only three months, it's hard to get any sort of feet under you in a mm -hmm. leadership position after three months. I would limit it at six. Right, yeah, whatever our probationary period yeah. is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. but I'm, I'm concerned that probation may be three months. Oh, I see. So well, it is six. Okay, six months. Okay. Yeah. We've got the boss over there, so. so. All right. So I'd be in favor of that for six months. Yeah. Yep. yep. Any comments, concerns, questions, Dan? No, I'll ask them. Okay, Lon? You're not going anywhere. No. Val, <laughs> anything? <laughs> no, nothing for there. I'm good with it. All right. We get a motion we need to, to amend. I mean, I will okay. say that I have that amended to a six month leave of absence or a probationary period, whichever, you know, would be terminated sooner. Does that make sense? And then we'll, we'll attach that as part of this. Sure. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make that motion. I stand up second. I'll second that. Thanks, Bonnie. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Josh. Um, attorney's report. Uh, we have a document in front of us here and you know, the Heiser uh, update. So this is the document that we were looking at last time. Um, the, does it have my name on the last page? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. So <coughs> we had some discussion at the last meeting about this uh, encroachment agreement. Thank you. Um, uh, we received from the title company attorney a draft, a redraft of this, or a restated draft of this encroachment agreement. He took out the indemnity language. <laughs> well, that's this is the draft, this is essentially his draft, just adding back in the indemnity language. So, I, I'm still concerned, I still don't recommend this course of action. Um, but here is what I would recommend. If, if the, the decision is made to amend this encroachment agreement, this is the encroachment agreement that I would recommend the city uh, respond back with. Like I said, I'm still a bit uncomfortable with it's essentially giving up part of our easement. I'm still very uncomfortable with that, so it's not my recommendation. But if the decision, like I said, is made to go ahead and, and revise this encroachment agreement essentially to allow him to, if the garage comes down for whatever reason, he can put it back up in the same spot. So essentially it's a, it is a, the city giving up that two and a half feet that, it's current, that that garage is currently encroaching into that drainage easement. This is the... You know, I, I wouldn't, I don't see any reason whatsoever to agree to what the title company's attorney sent over. I, I, there's no advantage whatsoever to the city entering into that agreement. There's still some advantage to the city by having this indemnity language in there in this agreement. Um, even though I'm, I'm not comfortable recommending that as a route that the city takes. Again, I, I feel like um, there has been a threat of litigation. I feel like the city is in a really good position as far as that litigation goes. I, I don't think that the city is going to, you know, they're, they're going to sue the city to try and rescind this encroachment agreement. Okay, you're still two feet into our easement. So I don't see that, I don't see that the city has a lot to lose going through the litigation um, to, to essentially um, maintain its easement that it has. Um, and that would be my recommendation to just tell them that we're denying the variance and we're not going to um, restate the encroachment agreement. But again, if the decision is made that we do want to negotiate with these folks simply to avoid the litigation, this would be my recommendation. Okay, thank you. Any questions on that? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Was the original encroachment agreement in the packet last time? Or has that different something that you're seeing? Um, I don't think it was in the packet. I haven't 
Was the original like in the meeting? packet last meeting? I don't oh, remember. you know what? It was. I think it was. The last yeah. 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 yeah, it was the last meeting. Last meeting. And I, I, I do have it handy if you can navigate through all my chicken scratching. Okay. Um, the so, just to rip, my understanding is you guys are probably going to have a different. Was there a discussion on that in the meeting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, the variance came back uh, and we took action and denied the variance. Uh, but to remind you, the variance request was the existing structure plus an addition. Right. The addition is what they were after. Yep. And with this agreement here, the two and a half feet, they're already built on. They're already built on. And what this, basically what this says is that we still maintain that easement, but if the garage burns down, they can build it right back in the same spot. Same Otherwise, point. right, the way it is now, before this agreement, if the structure gets blown away, they couldn't rebuild there. They'd have to build it somewhere else. Sure, that's up by two and a half feet on that side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't in the packet last last time. It was a closed meeting. You talked to them about it. So oh. yeah, I you know when you say that it was in the planning commission packet for oh, that last yeah, meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> So the, what you're looking at now is the agreement that was done in 2018 with the prior property owners that was, and if you flip back the page, you can see it was recorded. Yep. Yeah, I can see that in there as well. Because I'll just kind of reiterate what, my, what I said last meeting was, I understand exactly what you're saying. You know, I, I guess for me, it's already in the two and a half feet. All we're doing is saying you can put the same garage back in the event that that happens, the odds of that ever happening are pretty nil. We have good odds in litigation of getting sued, but we also have a track record of not having the greatest odds sometimes. So I just don't trust judges. <laughs> so um, probably should have said that. <laughs> um, we can redact that part. Of yeah. <laughs> We've had good results lately. No, I know. There's been okay. some good results, but. I don't know, for me, to, to even just the threat or of dollars of litigation, uh, are we set, what kind of precedent are we setting is what I'm, if we would be a brand new construction saying, hey, we would like to file for the variance to build this within the two and a half feet that's not already there, then it's not a question, it's a no. Correct. But it's been there for 10 years. 15 years. 15 years. No to the variance they asked for to make it even bigger into the, the right of way, but for that two and a half feet that's already there, put myself in the shoes of the, the homeowner, I would have to mm. well, say something. Mm. Did, didn't Brandon, didn't you say that if we had to replace that, we would be able to put the pipe in there? Yeah, it's more difficult, which means more costly and more risk for the city. And again, you're building very close to a footing of a garage. Um, that's my biggest fear. Um, you know, the mayor mentioned, you know, the house, well, let's look at it. Let's look at it from a different perspective, replacing that pipe from a public works perspective. You know, that's what we're going to be up against. Um, but then again, the house will probably last as long as the pipe, so it's, I mean, I, like, the probability of it happening in our lifetime is pretty low, but that's my concern from a public works, that's why we recommend to not vacate it, so. Okay. Anybody else? likely permanent encroachment converting it to a permanent encroachment. Mm -hmm. So you know, what's what's the difference? Right. The difference is we have somebody else to turn from somebody else who's screwed up trying to drag us in the middle of it. Yeah. <laughs> Does this still protect us? Well, without the identification I was the yeah. said already said that's that's firewood. Right. Yeah. But this agreement does have that. Right. Yeah, this one that's does. What the I one that they sent over for the re Right. No, so that's it. And that was a good, good catch there. Sure. So the, the change that I handed the note on uh, page two, paragraph one, I would change it to read the tree acknowledges the encroachment as opposed to approves. And um, 
I don't really like the end of that. The landowner together with any future owner shall have the right to improve repair and or reconstruct. I would like to remove the word improve. Yeah. Yeah. And I would also like to read the next line, repair and or reconstruct the garage at its expense only to the same extent and manner as the garage now yeah. approaches. Yeah. So yeah. just to really tighten it up a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so I agree. eliminate approves up top. You got it, Greg. Okay. Eliminate approves, go with acknowledges, and then we'll eliminate that second improve and just go with repair or reconstruct at its expense only to the same extent. So we can make those changes. I mean, I, I agree with Melanie. I don't like it. Yeah. We didn't do anything wrong. Right, but. But I understand where you're coming from. I mean, taking off the lawyer hat, putting on the not wanting to risk litigation. I get it. I don't like it. <laughs> but I get it. But I also don't want to give anything else away, given that we were not in the wrong to begin with. Well, to a certain degree, because the, the inspection should have caught that, the building permit, sure. who's representing the city, should have caught that. So there is some culpability, but uh, it's small. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, comments, concerns? And I totally understand where you're coming from. I have to do in the record and bold. Um, okay. Um, Lonnie, do you have anything? No. Okay. I'll make the motion to approve the agreement with the indemnification language and the changes. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Motion passes four to one with Burton. Okay. Number two. 2017. Yeah. One of those wins. Thompson. She was talking exactly, about it. right? Yeah. The Court of Appeals uh, affirmed the district court uh, uh, judgment in our favor. So it's, it's done. Perfect. Thank you. And we won. Thank you. Appreciate it. Correspondence. Any questions on correspondence? We have the police chief to be here. Any questions on the police status? Put you on the hot seat right away. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like calls are still down compared to a year ago just because of the activity and things yeah. being closed and people being smarter and obey, obeying the law better. Yeah. A large part of it is tra traffic yeah. comes. Okay. Um, usually we do a seatbelt wave already and we did that got moved to November. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Any questions? A couple other things I just want to highlight in there. There, I thought were interesting. You do have the population estimates, so I mean, we're we're closing in. I'm, you know, it looks like to me we're going to probably be around a little over 6,600 with the census. You know, if we get a good count, we are actually one of the highest count percentage-wise in the state. We're over 80 percent that have already gotten their, their paperwork in, so that's great. And then I know the mayor had asked for this earlier this year, um, and this is the bio bot that we had talked about. And so I thought this was interesting. If you take a look at that um, page there, it's page 46. Um, this is something the mayor had been interested in, and we are as well. We actually were submitting samples to this company that's doing for over 350 municipalities throughout the nation. And it shows the, the actual number of cases that are being reported in Dodge County. And this, they're about two weeks behind. So this sample was the, the, the May 12th sample. Um, at that time, there were 26 cases that they were seeing reported in Dodge County. Mm -hmm. And based off of the uh, the virus concentration in the sewage, they, they, they estimated there were 150 cases in Casson at that time. And Manorville. So we uh, we actually, we were able to, we sampled only Casson. Okay. So we shunted theirs off. I mean, that case count would have gone way up, you know. So, uh, <laughs> don't report any of that. Okay, <laughs> come on now. Uh, but, but no, I mean, so I'd be mean, fascinating to see, though, that's what they're saying. So obviously there are cases there that we don't know about. But, um, so, and we're going to, as these come out, we're going to be providing these just so we can kind of track how mm -hmm. the month of May looked. We aren't planning on continuing that service after the month of May because of the cost. The cost is going to go up dramatically. But right. I thought it was interesting to see that snapshot. So 
and I actually had a friend who works in the lab at Mayo develop the tests for different things, and I shared that report with her. She asked for that on the website of the company because they're doing a similar okay. study now too. So cool. So fun stuff we get to deal with every day. Do it. Anything else? Thanks for coming out, everybody, on our channel, Motion for Adjournment. Mike Temple, thanks, Dan. Do I have a second? Second. Well, thank you. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned and go enjoy your evening. What are you doing? What are you doing? Let's see, man. Stay on the northwest side of the hall. Try to figure it out. Which page is that? Page two. Yeah. Okay, Warriors. Okay. And two, three, one. Two, three, four, two, one. Oh, you got it up there, what? Give time for a question. You back. Okay. What's going on? So the pool is still in the 19th floor. They're shooting for the 19th floor. And that's kind of the earliest date they thought. And Tim would be a better one to ask that. But I think that's the earliest date. I'll think seven. Okay. All right. Just kind of get off the hard end. They're going to start ramping up now. And if it takes about two weeks, two weeks.